Welcome to Acton Line, the podcast of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Eric Cohn, executive producer. On December 2nd, 2020, the economist Walter E. Williams passed away at the age of 84. Williams worked his way out of grinding poverty in the Philadelphia housing projects to chair George Mason University's economics department. Over his career, he authored 10 books and more than 150 other publications and became one of the most recognized commentators on our American public life of the last four decades. Williams spread his message of racial equality, the dignity of work, and the morality of capitalism through his syndicated newspaper column, PBS documentaries, and frequent radio and TV appearances. Today, we feature a conversation with Dr. Williams from 2014 for the Acton Institute's podcast, then called Radio Free Acton. Host Paul Edwards discusses with Williams the significance of Frederick Bastiat's classic publication, The Law, and the insights into modern America that come from reading that classic defense of limited government, authentic justice, and human freedom. At that time, Williams had just penned a new introduction to the law, which he said, quote, created order in my thinking about liberty and just human conduct. You can find additional resources in the show notes for this episode, as well as find previous episodes of Acton Line on our website at acton.org slash actonline. And if you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Act in Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. Here at the Acton Institute, we have uh, an executive director and co-founder, Chris Morin, who way back in grad school, and I think it's grad school, was handed a copy of Frederick Bastier's The Law, totally revolutionized his thinking on, on political philosophy. At every turn, Chris encourages audiences everywhere. Every time I've heard him speak, he encourages audience to get this little pamphlet and read it. Well, finally, two weeks ago, I picked it up at uh, the Acton Bookstore and and read it, then reread it, and then read it again. I, I think that I've got some of the salient points memorized, but this book really brings down to a lay level all of the issues related to the defense of liberty and why liberty is so important. And if you care at all about the erosion of liberty that we are really seeing right here in the United States of America, I can't recommend to you highly enough that you read Frederick Bastier's The Law. The copy that I have has an introduction written by uh, Walter Williams, and uh, you know Walter Williams. He is an American economist. Uh, You've heard him on the Rush Limbaugh show. He is the John M. Olin Distinguished Professor of Economics at George Mason University. And in his introduction to uh, the copy of The Law that I have, he writes, The law did not produce the philosophical conversion for me as much as it created order in my thinking about liberty and just human conduct. And uh, Professor Williams, it's an honor to welcome you here to Radio Free Acton. Well, thank you very much. I know it's a long time ago you wrote this introduction, but but talk about the, the influence of this little pamphlet on, on your own thinking. Well, I think uh, 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 Frederick Bastiat's uh, the, the Law, I mean, it's a very, very simple uh, way, or, or it's very easily to understand way, uh, uh, method to understand uh, what's the role of government and what's the role of laws uh, in a free society? And uh, although uh, Bastia does not say this in the law, uh, the I guess the initial moral point to start thinking about many issues that we face as as a world and more particularly as a nation is that uh, where, where do you start off? Well, my initial premise is that each of us owns ourselves. That is, I am my private property, and, and you are your private property. Now, when you, if you accept the idea of self-ownership, well, then certain acts are immoral, and certain acts are moral. That is, the reason why rape is immoral is because it violates private property. Uh, murder 
is immoral again because it violates private property and uh, and and so is theft and I think that uh, one of the things that Bastiat makes clear in the uh, uh, in in the book he points out that uh, that that theft is theft no matter who does it he just calls it when the government engages in the activity of taking the property of one American and giving it to another American to whom, to whom it does not belong he just calls that legalized plunder it's just legal plunder and it's the it has the same uh, moral uh, immoral overtones as when as private plunder if you privately take uh, a person's money to give to somebody else for whatever reason, well, well, that's private theft. And when the government does it through uh, Congress, it's just it's still theft, but it's just legalized theft. He he really, for me anyway, Doctor Williams, he 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 articulates something that I'd never thought of before in in our day with our full time legislatures both on the uh, on the state level and the national level we we seem to think okay well the we need these men and women to be doing something bastiat would say no we don't uh, it would be better if they didn't meet uh, because the law serves uh, the uh, the citizenry best when it, it it approaches things negatively the minute the law starts doing something the minute we put into law Okay, uh, we've got we've got a poor person, so we're going to make a law that says we've got to take money from the wealthy and give it to the poor person. We've got an uneducated person, so we're going to make a law that says we're going to take money from people and educate that that person. He viewed the law as negative in his in his word, meaning that the law the, the law serves best when it does least. Yeah, or 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 I may be uh, a better way of uh, of looking at uh, at at negative rights or negative laws is that uh, take take for instance my 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 uh, my right to free speech uh, that such a right exists simultaneously among people and it confers no obligation on anyone else except that of non-interference my right to travel freely freely imposes no obligation on anybody else except that of non-interference now if we use the word right the way that is so it's so commonly used today and and as you mentioned the so-called positive law or positive rights well then then my right to free speech would require somebody else to to supply me with an auditorium and, a, and an office mm-hmm. or or my right to uh, to travel would require somebody else uh, uh, provide me with airplane and hotel accommodations and and I think one of the points that's implied by uh, Bastiat's uh, writing and in the law is that if someone has a right to something that he did not earn, then of necessity someone else does not have a right to what he did earn mm. because government has no resources of its very own. That And what I mean by that is that those programs coming out of Washington or coming out of the state legislature, it doesn't represent congressmen and legislators reaching in their own pockets to send out the money. Moreover, there's no tooth fairy or Santa Claus that's providing the money. And so when you recognize that government has no resources of its very own, that forces you to recognize that the only way the government can give one American citizen one dollar is to first, through intimidation, threats, and coercion, confiscate that dollar from some other American. And as I point out, that is, if someone has a right to something that he did not earn, well, of necessity, it requires that someone else not have a right to what he did earn, and I think that that's immoral. Bastia would would certainly not have viewed all taxation as confiscation. Now, much of taxation in, in, in the United States of America, much of the United States tax code today, Maybe maybe much is painting with too broad of a brush, but but it, it goes without saying that that the, the U.S. tax code is uh, confiscatory in, in in many of its uh, policies. Bastiat would not be opposed to taxation per se. So when we talk about the the, the rightful use of citizens' money of taking money from them. What would be, uh, in your view, as one of the leading economists today, uh, Dr. Williams, what would be a rightful use of taxation versus uh, what what Bastiat would consider legal plunder? Yeah, well, well, I think uh, 
I think the answer to that is very easy. That is, uh, I have the right to defend myself. That is a natural right. I have, my, I have a right to defend myself against predators. Now, since I have that right as a human being, I can then delegate that right. I can delegate a right to government. I can say, well, look, uh, I, I have the right to protect myself against predators, but we can have a more orderly society if I delegate that right to you. Mm. So therefore, we should have uh, uh, national defense and, and, and police services, and everybody is obligated to pay his uh, uh, share through, through taxation, I guess. Now, now, however, I do not have the right to take money from somebody else either from my own use or from or or to take money from somebody else to help somebody else. So therefore I cannot delegate that right because I don't hold that I don't own that right. And so I think this is what uh, Bastiat would say is uh, that you can only delegate rights that you have and 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 somehow we have to pay for that or even or as as uh, as, as our fellow American past fellow American Thomas Paine said that government on under the best of circumstances, is a necessary evil. Because he realized that, well, the essence of government is coercion, but we need some government to protect us against uh, people violating the pro- our property rights. But he said, well, the essence, he said that the uh, government is a necessary evil, he said, but it can become an intolerable evil, evil. So if you have too much government, we have an intolerable evil, as we have today in the United States, or increasingly so. And it becomes this intolerable evil, Dr. Williams, with the best of intentions. Our, our, our legislatures, both on the state level and the, the federal level, uh, you know, Bastier, uh, or Bastiat, I should say, talks in his, his book about these, uh, these uh, benevolent legislatures. He says, when a politician views society from the seclu- seclusion of his office, he is struck by the spectacle of the inequality that he sees. He deplores the deprivations, which are the lot of so many of our brothers, deprivations which appear to be even sadder when contrasted with luxury and wealth. Perhaps the politician, Bastiat says, should ask himself whether this state of affairs has not been caused by old conquests and lootings and, and, uh, and by more recent legal plunder, perhaps he should consider this proposition. Since all persons seek well-being and perfection, would not a condition of justice be sufficient to cause the greatest efforts toward progress and the greatest possible equality that is compatible with individual responsibility? But it seems, Dr. Williams, that our benevolent legislators have this what what Bastiat would call this philanthropic view of the law, that when it sees a need, we've got to make a law to cause the citizens to meet the need rather than relying on the citizens' own natural, God-given goodwill. Well, I, I, I think that... <laughs> I think that you might be giving our legislators and our congressmen uh, too much of the benefit of the doubt. You might be looking at them, uh, to, uh, you know, uh, uh, in a way that's not appropriate. Because legislators, they they do things like, and as uh, as uh, Bastiat points out, he says uh, that uh, legal plunder has many names, and among the names for legal plunder. That uh, that Congress engages in, and the state legislatures among those names of legal and plunder, legal plunder are tariffs, uh, tariff protection, uh, subsidies, uh, progressive taxation, public schools, uh, the minimum wage laws, uh, the right to welfare, and all those things that Congress engages in, and they say that they're doing it, uh, you know, out of the best of intentions, but they're being paid. They get political contributions from doing this. They get, uh, you know, if, if, if you go to Washington, D.C., you see uh, hundreds of thousands of lobbyists and, the, and, and congressmen getting hundreds of thousands, millions and millions of dollars of campaign contributions. Now, why are these companies, labor unions, and other interest groups paying Congress, uh, giving Congress all this money. They darn sure aren't doing it so that Congress will uphold and defend the United States Constitution. Mm. 
they're doing it because they want a special favor. They want access. Uh, they, you know, they uh, a congressman will will support tariffs, and and he'll say, well, we need to protect American industry uh, from from cheap foreign goods. Well, when this when you say protecting American industry, that's the same as saying we're going to screw the American consumer. To yeah. higher prices. Bastier would say his definition, one of his definitions of the law is law is organized justice. He says the purpose of the law is to prevent injustice from reigning. Our postmodern ears hear that, Professor Williams, and they say, OK, well, if the purpose of the law is to prevent injustice from reigning, then Roe v. Wade was the right decision. Uh, all of these equality laws that have been passed by Congress uh, are are the are, are the right decision coming down on Hobby Lobby and making them provide contraceptives uh, against the owner's uh, religious convictions is right because that's justice. H- how are our postmodern ears misunderstanding what Bastiat meant by uh, preventing injustice from reigning versus what our, our current Congress, our current legislatures, both at the state and national level, are doing to uh, to kind of force equality. Well, I, I think that one of the, that is there, there's equality. Uh, any measure to us to produce equality, other than equality before the law, is going to lo- lead to the lack of liberty. Uh, that is, we are we are not equal human beings. We're we're equal in the eyes of God, but we're not equal he- human beings. Some of us have skills, and some of us have have uh, tendencies uh, different from other people. Now, so what you expect in a free society is that we all be equal in the eyes of law. And and so far as you know, having uh, 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 lawsuits against various forms of uh, discrimination, uh, lawsuit you know, uh, forcing people to uh, treat everybody equally, I think that violates it's a basic human right. I think that that as so long as a person is not using government, he has the right to freely, freely associate with anybody he pleases for any reason. And and you might uh, find that some uh, uh, some forms of association might be offensive. But the true test of whether someone believes in freedom of association, freedom of speech, uh, or or any other freedom, is when you allow people to be free to do those voluntary things that you find offensive. I'm a huge baseball fan, and, and this issue of equality, obviously, you think about Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier, but you look back at that, I think there's a lesson that, that we could learn from Jackie Robinson's breaking the color barrier. Th- th- that was not mandated by law that Jackie Robinson should be able to play baseball for the Brooklyn Dodgers. It was really market forces. No, that's you're absolutely you're absolutely right, and 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 the market forces would have uh, occurred earlier if the government did not give the uh, the uh, the major league baseball teams a monopoly, a cartel. And but when when Branch Rickey decided, well, he's going to interfere with this cartel, then then the other people uh, had to, you know, other teams had to follow suit. It's the same thing uh, uh, that at one time blacks were not allowed in professional basketball. Or professional football, there was discrimination against them. But today, blacks are eighty percent of professional basketball players, and close to seventy percent of the professional football players, and the highest earners. And uh, and they, and there was no law that that made this happen. It was just the market forces. That is, people just could not uh, afford to continue to race, you know, to use. Uh, characteristics that have nothing to do with a person's productivity. And the reason why uh, blacks dominate basketball is that they, they, these guys can do a 360 slam dunk in your face and you can't do anything about it. <laughs> yeah. It, it, let's talk for a moment about uh, about the reality of, of, uh, of what's happening in black America. Um, we've got the first black president, and it seems like that, what kind of black? Well, and, and and this is the question, because we were supposed to, I mean, having elected the first black president, Dr. Williams, wasn't that supposed to totally revolutionize the plight of the black man in, in America? And has it? Uh, no way in the world. If, if you read a 2008 column, I, I predicted that, and this was before Obama uh, took uh, took office. 
the the major problems that black black Americans face, a large segment of black Americans face, is uh, uh, has nothing to do with racial discrimination. Uh, for example, the seventy five percent illegitimacy uh, rate among black Americans that's a devastating problem, but doesn't have anything to do with racial discrimination. Uh, the, uh, the 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 high crime rates in uh, black communities that's a devastating problem, but doesn't have anything to do with discrimination. Matter of fact, uh, uh, blacks are thirteen percent of the population, but slightly over fifty five percent of the homicide victims, and most uh, most of them are killed by other blacks. Now, there's one thing that people when people look at the history of black Americans or, or black Americans in the United States, they do not recognize that black Americans as a group have made the greatest gains over some of the highest hurdles in the shortest period of time than any other racial group in the history of mankind. Now, why would I say that? Well, if you just added up the income that black Americans earn each year and thought of us as a nation, we would be the 17th or 18th richest nation. It was a black American in the form of uh, Colin Powell who headed the world's mightiest military. Uh, there are a few black Americans that are among some of the richest Americans, richest people in the world. There are many other black Americans who are among the most famous personalities. Now, in 1865, neither a slave nor a slave owner would have believed that this kind of progress would be possible in just a little bit over a, a, a century. Now, and as such, it speaks to the intestinal fortitude of a people, but just as importantly, it speaks to the greatness of a nation in which these kind of gains were possible. They would not have been possible anywhere else on the face of Earth except the United States of America. Now, the question that remains is how can we extend these gains for a large segment of the black population, maybe around 30 percent, for whom these gains uh, uh, appear to be elusive? Well, it seems that the, that the way the African-American leadership answers that question is to say, well, we have to have political remedies. But as you pointed out in an interview that I watched with uh, Reason.TV this morning, uh, I don't know when that interview was recorded, but you look at the, 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 uh, the major uh, cities in America that have black leadership, black mayors, black chief of police, uh, b- black city councils. I'm sitting in one of those cities right now recording so this black interview. Black superintendent of schools, and, and you find that black people in, in those cities where blacks have major political power, uh, you know, they, they, uh, much of the black population is, is, is devastated. And so it's a mistake to think that political power uh, yields uh, economic power, leads to economic powers. And one classic example example that at the other extreme is that Japanese Americans have no political power even in the cities where they're the most numerous. But however, Japanese Americans are at the top of the socioeconomic uh, uh, pile. Uh, the same thing with Jewish Americans. Jewish Americans did not had had economic power long before they had any kind of political power in the United States. So it's I think it's a uh, people are being sold a good a bill of goods by hustlers. Uh, uh, and, and people I call poverty pimps, that uh, that uh, that power and well-being comes through the political arena. That's a big mistake. Frederick Bastiat would have uh, characterized that, uh, what we're talking, Dr. Williams, about political power. He would have put it in the phrase of universal suffrage. Uh, And he was – I don't know that you can say he was opposed to it, but he certainly doesn't say flattering things about the idea that if every human being had the right to vote, that this would would solve uh, our political problems. Uh, He felt like people only wanted the right to vote either to participate in the legal plunder and to benefit from it. Uh, or to uh, or to protect their own rights from being legally plundered, but once they're in the political process, nobody wants to abol- abolish legal plunder. So, what about this universal suffrage, the 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 the, the right to vote, and and Bastiat's idea that you know the idea that you have the the power in your hand, the reality is human nature is such that you wouldn't do anything to get rid of the legal plunder. You would just participate more in it. 
Oh, they're that, they're, oh you're absolutely right. And uh, and and as a matter of fact, uh, uh, the uh, uh, it turns out that close to fifty percent of Americans pay no federal income tax, have no federal income tax liability. And so, what does that mean? That's devastating. Them, and, and they have a right to vote. And so, they become natural constituents for the big spending politicians because uh, the you know, if people are not don't have any federal tax uh, uh, obligation. Well, what do they care about whether taxes go up or taxes go down? That, so that's that's very very dangerous uh, uh, for our country. But but I, I think that I think that people I think that, that people should have a right to vote. But see the the problem the problem is is that what are they voting on? That is, if the uh, people have the right to vote on how my income is being spent. I think that's wrong, but but it, for for most of our history, federal spending was no was between three and five percent of the GDP from from seventeen seventeen eighty seven until the mid nineteen twenties. Uh, it was only uh, three to five percent of the GDP, and so people could not use uh, uh, Congress to uh, rip off people. And then also something else that Bastiat uh, points out is that. Uh, the kind of plunder that goes on, where where Congress is, uh, people are voting for congressmen to take somebody else's money and bring it back to them in the form of uh, highway construction funds, aid to higher education, uh, business bills, et cetera, et cetera. Well, once that gets started, it pays for everybody to get involved. That is, I mean, if if I'm running for the Senate and I go back and forth across the state of Pennsylvania, I say, look, I read the Constitution of the United States. If you would like me to office. As a senator from Pennsylvania, don't expect for me to bring back uh, highway construction funds, uh, uh, aid to uh, higher education, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the people in Pennsylvania or any other state would be absolutely right not electing me to the uh, to the Senate. And the reason why is that if I don't bring back uh, all these goodies. Uh, for people, well, it doesn't mean that Pennsylvanians will pay a lower federal income tax. All that it means is that New Jersey will get it instead. Mm. That is, once legalized plunder begins, it's rational for everybody to participate in it, and uh, and and that's the that does not bode well for the future of our nation. Is there an answer? Uh, we we seem to have come so far down this economic path of of just legalized plunder and everybody participating in it and nobody wanting to abolish it, uh, and we've seen what it's gotten us: uh, de- uncontrolled deficits uh, and uh, higher taxes and really little to uh, to show for it. But is there, Doctor Williams, an economic answer to the to this uh, to this dilemma that we find ourselves in? Here uh, in the in the early decades of the 21st century, I, I I don't believe there's an economic answer. I think the problem has to be identified as it's a moral problem, and I think that uh, people like uh, like the Acton Institute and the work great work that Father Sharika is doing. I think that's part of the solution. That is what we have to do. We have to sell our fellow man on the moral superiority of personal liberty, and its main ingredient is limited government. We have to sell our fellow Americans on the idea that, yes, help your fellow man out in need, but when you help your fellow man in need by reaching into your own pockets to help him out, that's praiseworthy and laudable. When you seek to help your fellow man in need by reaching into somebody else's pockets, that's worthy of condemnation, and it's the Despicable. And for the Christians among us, they must recognize when God gave Moses the Eighth Commandment, thou shalt not steal, he did not mean that thou shalt not steal unless you got a majority vote in Congress. <laughs> Moreover, if you had a heart-to-heart talk with God and say, okay, God, I'm, I'm not stealing, but is it okay to be a recipient of stolen property? I'm very sure that God would deem that a sin as well. So we have before us, we have a huge moral job. And I think uh, Bastiat's work is a good, is, you know, 
getting more and more people to become familiar with it, I think that's a very, very important step. And, and again, the kind of work that uh, uh, Father Sharika and, uh, and, and the Acton Institute is doing to try to convince uh, uh, ministers and, and others involved in the church uh, on the, moral, uh, on the uh, uh, moral superiority of personal liberty and its main ingredient, limited government. Bastiat mentions God by name 18 times, another 16 times he refers to nature, either human nature or uh, that which we've been given by, by nature. I- is it possible to have a just liberty uh, without that moral foundation that's rooted in natural rights and certainly rooted in, in the fact that there is a God who is ultimate judge? Well, the short answer is no. I think uh, that, that there can't be liberty unless there's this moral foundation. And in general, uh, uh, distrust for government, like the, like the founders of our nation had. I mean, if, if, the, if, you, if you look at the, the Constitution, particularly the Bill of Rights, just look at the language of the Bill of Rights. It says, Congress shall not prohibit, Congress shall not infringe, Congress shall not disparage. I mean, the founders had a great distrust for Congress, uh, and because, but they again, they knew that we needed some government. Matter of fact, I've told people that when we die, and if at our next destination we see anything like a Bill of Rights, we know that we're in hell. Because a Bill of Rights in heaven would be an insult to God. It would be saying we can't trust God. Basiat's last line in his book is, <clears throat> Liberty is an acknowledgment of faith in God and, and in his works. It would seem, Dr. Williams, that where we've come to uh, in, in American history is, is just pure humanism in terms of our faith in man, our faith in our ability, our faith in Congress to be able to take from those who have and give it to those who don't and balance things out. And we've totally lost the concept of just trusting God and that which he has infused in the nature of man to allow men to, 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 to flourish, to give them freedom. And by men, I mean that in the, in the, uh, in the broad sense of, uh, of women as well, but allowing human beings to simply exercise their God-given gifts to contribute to culture, to produce, and, to, and, and if you just leave them alone, there should be a flourishing in the culture. But it seems like we've opted for a humanistic approach rather well, than, well, than a theistic. A lot of it, in addition to what you're saying, I think there's been a massive attack on the basic institutions that make for a civilized society, uh, uh, such as the family, such as the ideas of uh, about uh, uh, marriage and all these other, they, I mean, there's been a sustained attack on the institutions that make for civility. If you just ask yourself the question, uh, uh, if, if you invited me to your house, now, I would not put my feet on the cocktail table in your house. Now, it's not because there's a law that I'll get arrested if I do that. It's that it's it's custom and tradition means that I should not do that. Now, uh, when, what we find is that the the more society has depend on laws, written laws, the the more uncivilized. Uh, it has become, and 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 normally people, you know, it's historically in our country, people did not do certain things because it was not right to do it, they or they believed that it was a sin. Today, all that has changed. You can do whatever you want to do so long as there's not a law. Uh, that is, if if you look at, uh, you know, when I was I'm 78 years old. When I was a kid, people did not say the kind of things in front of women that men routinely say in front of women today. Well, how do we protect women? Well, historically, we taught, we protect the women by, by teaching little boys to be gentlemen, to, to not, never hit a woman, a woman under any circumstances. Now we protect women through sexual harassment codes mm. we, uh, and other kinds of uh, activities, and, and we ignore the, uh, the institution of the past because cause we've, we've destroyed uh, or we've attacked many of those institutions and many of those values. This moral rootedness, it really goes to the heart of what Basquiat says in in one part of his book, and I don't have it in front of me, so I can't quote it exactly, but I'll paraphrase. The the idea that the law cannot make moral that which is by nature immoral, and yet you look at Roe v. Wade as one massive example 
the immorality of taking the life of a child in its mother's womb. And yet uh, today, uh, 35 years after Roe, well, the law says it's OK. So we, we, we justify I- immorality and, and what we would normally consider an infringement of, of our moral code because, well, now the law has said it's OK to do so. Well, it, well the, these, the, this is just one of the laws that, that cheapen human life. That is, uh, uh, that is uh, people will do things to other people because uh, human life has been cheapened by many things that we've done. I want to finish with just one, one really controversial thing that I think Bastier says that has application to where we are uh, here towards the, uh, the, the, the middle of the second term of our current president. He, he refers to a, a politician, a French politician in his own day, a contemporary of his uh, named Maximilien uh, Robespierre. Uh, yeah. and, and he says, uh, Robespierre copies Rousseau literally. The legislator begins by decreeing the end for which the Commonwealth has come into being. And he says, Robespierre wants a dictatorship in order that he may use terror to force upon the country his own principles of morality. And not until he shall have accomplished his miracles, as he so rightly calls them, will he permit the law to reign again. I read that, and it was hauntingly familiar to uh, Barack Obama's speech after uh, he won the election and he said that it would let Americans let the world mark this as the moment that the uh, the uh, the environment began to heal the oceans began to um, whatever it was he said he he put himself almost in a position Dr. Williams of 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 being the guy that is performing this uh, Moses kind of miracle on on the environment, and it seems he's governed in that way with executive orders. What he can't get done through a representative democracy through the Congress, he just writes a he just writes his own executive order. And even with the Affordable Care Act, he changed the law at 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 will. Is tyranny too strong a word for what we're experiencing? Well, I I, I think that uh, you can you can say that, but I think that the the biggest problem is the American people. That is, uh, the, it's the American people who've decided that they that, that they will not rebel against a person who who, who dumps on the Constitution of the United States, and the, the very fact that he became the president uh, is is a sad statement about the American people. That is, this is the first time in our history that a person could have been elected to the highest office in the land who had a long time association with people who hated our country such as Reverend Wright such as Bill Ayers and his wife and the weather underground no other president could have ever uh, no other person could have won the presidency with that kind of background and so what we see it's a failing of the american people that is that is you take you take one of the founders like James Madison, and in 1794, uh, uh, Congress appropriated fifteen thousand dollars to help some French refugees. St- James Madison stood on the floor of the House irate, and he said, and I'm virtually quoting him. He says, "I cannot undertake to lay my finger on that article in the Constitution that authorizes Congress to spend the money of their constituents for the purposes of benevolence." Now, today, uh, uh, two thirds, three quarters of the federal budget is spent for the purpose of benevolence, but if, if if any politician said the same thing, and including Madison's statement saying that that charity is no part of the legislative duty of government, if any politician said the same thing today, that he would be run out of town by the American people. The, the American people uh, have developed a level of contempt. Uh, whether they knowing they they do it deliberately or unknowingly, they've developed a level of contempt for personal liberty. They believe, through many programs, they believe that government ought to be in the business of taking what belongs to one American and giving it to another to whom it does not belong. And so, th- that seems like a very very difficult job to change that. All the more reason that every person listening to us, Dr. Williams, should get a copy of Bastiat's The Law and uh, and then also uh, continue to come here to, to the Acton Institute at acton.org and avail themselves of resources that help them re- remind us of, of first principles. And uh, certainly Bastiat does that with his excellent little fam- pamphlet, The Law. Yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah. 
Walter Williams is uh, the John M. Olin Distinguished Professor of Economics at George Mason University. He's a syndicated columnist and uh, author, and you know him. And Dr. Williams, it's, it's just been a personal joy for us here at Radio Free Acton and the Acton Institute to, uh, to have you as a guest on this podcast. And thank you very much. As always, thank you so much for listening today. Our team loves putting this show together for you every week. And it's so encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can reach our team at actonline at actin.org. Until next week, for Acton Line, I'm Eric Cohn.